my name is Jerry Gill. Today is February 19th, 2009. I'm visiting with Nancy Randolph Davis here in the ConocoPhillips OSU Alumni Center on the Oklahoma State University campus. This interview is for the O State Storage Project uh, of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. And Nancy, thank you very much for being with us today uh, for this interview. I know you've had a busy day today. You were recognized earlier at, at Langston University, I think. That's right. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, Nancy, can you tell me a little bit about, starting off a little bit about your early life, about your family, uh, where you grew up? Yes, I would like for you to know that I grew up in Sapopo, Oklahoma. That's where I was born. Mm -hmm. My parents were Mr. Edna Pogan and Ernest Dean Renlaw. Mm -hmm. And my dad was a railroad man. He worked for the, for the Frisco Railroad Company. I had four brothers and one sister, and we stayed in a six-room house. We had to, uh, at that time, we lived across the street from the Booker T. Washington School, mm -hmm. and my parents were always there at home. My mother did not work. She said she was a homemaker. And my daddy had to go to Chaucer to work for the Frisco Railroad Company, which was located in West Chaucer, Oklahoma. Uh, they taught us to be sure to be clean, neat, respectful, mm -hmm. honest, and to always tell the truth. <laughs> Good. Well, what, uh, Nancy, what about your, uh, your, can you tell me a little about your family roots, a little about your family history? understand that they maybe your your great-grandparents were actually uh, slaves? Well, my mm -hmm. great-grandparents were slaves, but mm -hmm. my grandparents mm -hmm. were not slaves. Now, they, did they live in Texas? They lived in Marlin, Texas. Mm -hmm. My dad's people lived in Marlin, Texas. Mm -hmm. My mother's people lived in what you call a town called Yoakum, Texas. Mm -hmm. And when my mother came to Oklahoma, mm -hmm. they settled at Colbert, Oklahoma, and they came in a long wagon train, and you've heard of uh, Carl Evans? Carl Evans' daddy and my grandfather were cousins. I'd heard that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all stayed at different places, and they helped each other build little houses at that time. Mm -hmm. Coming into Oklahoma, they built houses along the way, and they would help each other. Mm -hmm. uh, Nancy, that was, that was that in 1903? Yeah, it was about 1900 or mm -hmm. 1903. I, mm -hmm. I don't remember the date exactly. So, Cla see, Claude grew up in uh, Poto. Poto, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. And then, and then you grew up in Sapapa. How did? Because y'all come up as a group, a family of about 30 families, I think, as I understand. Did well, you get a little scattered out then after that? Well, I don't know how many families there were, but I know there were at least seven or eight families. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, my mother's people, they, my mother's people uh, stayed there in Carver, Oklahoma. She had some sisters who lived there. And my daddy worked for the railroad company, so he was always on the road going. Mm -hmm. But his mother and father lived in Marlin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And they had a big farm there in Marlin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And they uh, lived across the street. They had a farm that uh, the highway ran through. And my dad's people usually had about eight or ten kids in the family. My daddy had less than any of them. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, my mother and father, mm -hmm. my oldest brother, one sister, and four brothers. And we all uh, lived in Sapapa. And we didn't, we, my dad went to Sapapa after he had uh, worked for the Frisco Ryan House, and that was close to Charleston. And that was as close as he could get at that particular time with a home. Mm -hmm. So they lived there in Sapapa, Oklahoma, and he would commute and use the bus for transportation back and forth to work. He'd go to work at 1 o'clock and come back by 12 at night. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, there were there some, you mentioned some things earlier, Nancy, about principles that your family instilled in you. Was was education, importance of education one of those? Oh, education was mm -hmm. the main thing. Get an education. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, you must finish high school. If you live in this household, 
you must get an education. So there were three of us who mm -hmm. attended college. Mm -hmm. My brother, um, Carl Dennis, my sister and I, we attended some kind of college. And I attended Langston University. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1944 through 1948. Okay. So it's an answer you, uh, uh, you, as you graduated Booker T. Washington High School in Sepulpa in 1944, then you enrolled at Langston that fall in 1944. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, was it was it common at that time for uh, you know for for African American women to attend college? I mean that was probably a little unusual, and then on your your part. Well, it was with my class of 1944 because our principal and his wife, D. A. Williams, and Jimmy A. Williams, they told us kids that they wanted to see us go to college. There's not enough kids from Sepulpa going to college. Mm -hmm. So we had some who had gone to college, but they wanted our class, and they mm -hmm. thought our class was kind of smart, and we should go to college. Mm -hmm. did, did you get any financial assistance to go to, to college? No, there wasn't any kind of financial mm -hmm. assistance. My dad had to work hard on the Frisco Railroad mm -hmm. Company. He worked day and night making sure that he saved enough money for us to go to college if we wanted to. Did, did, did you work part-time at school as a student? No, I did not. That's, that's good. But I did have a little Saturday job for our babysit. I made a dollar and a half a day. <laughs> <laughs> it's great wages. Well, Nancy, what, uh, what influenced you to seek a college degree? I know your parents certainly encouraged you for high school, but I mean, did you uh, did you know you you wanted to go to college? I mean, did you know what you wanted to be when you were in high school? Well, when I was in high school, I really knew that I wanted to be a home economics teacher. Mm -hmm. I had a teacher at my school by the name of Minnie Jackson. She was from my hometown. Mm -hmm. Minnie Johnson. Minnie, M I T T I E. Oh, Minnie. 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 I see. Minnie Jackson. So she she was a lady that we all have high esteem for. Mm -hmm. She was the one of us who said, Nancy, you would do good if you go to college mm -hmm. and major in home economics since you like to cook so well. And so you can sew pretty good so you can sew. And that's the main thing that they did in school back there so in home economics, sewing and cooking and maybe making baby clothing mm -hmm. and children clothing. And we did a little bit of uh, serving food for the high school football team because the football boys could not go to a restaurant and eat, so we served the boys after the football games mm -hmm. every Friday night that we had a game. Great. Did you have a good football and team? I was one of those who volunteered to serve. <laughs> did you have a good football team? We had a nice football. We were called the Sepulpa Bulldogs. And we had our little pep club, and we had our little blue skirts and white caps, mm -hmm. and we just really did go with the pep club. So were you a member of the pep club? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So did, did you lead the cheers and do things like that? Well, I did not lead the cheer. I mm -hmm. wasn't a cheerleader. Mm -hmm. You just in the pep club, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you see, so then when you, uh, or let me just first of all ask about a little bit your, briefly your experience at Langston, was it a good experience for you? Uh, and were you involved in other activities other than just school? Yes, class? Langston University was a place where I really received a lot of outlet mm -hmm. for experience because my home economics teachers would have us to fix meals, uh, fix cookies and mm -hmm. sandwiches, daily little sandwiches for teas. Mm -hmm. and make all kinds of tea, uh, tea uh, from uh, tea to use and lifting tea and all, mm -hmm. all of that and putting juice in it and lemons and so forth. That was a, a, an experience that we knew that we had to dress up for every Sunday evening oh, and go tea. to the tea and the tea would be held at Sanford Hall. Mm -hmm. So we enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. did, did you live on campus there in a residence hall? I lived in, uh, in the oldest building the first two years, the oldest building on the campus, mm -hmm. which was called Phyllis Wheatley Building. Mm -hmm. Phyllis Wheatley was a lady who wrote poems, and she was a slave. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So Nancy, you're, now your you're last year, you're talking about your T's, but your senior year, you had to live in a certain cottage together, the home economics majors, is that correct? Yes, Could you did. share a little bit of information about that? 
We lived in the home economics cottage, which was there across the street from Fellow Sweetney, mm -hmm. a little brick building. And uh, we had a home economics supervisor, mm -hmm. Mrs. Sadie G. Washington. Mm -hmm. And she taught we had to learn how to prepare breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and using the four basic foods at that time. Mm -hmm. And we always had our table man had to carry out table manners. We had to carry out our cooking terms and know how to, we cooked our different foods so we could share it with the class. Mm -hmm. And we would serve anybody who came to the campus that was new or somebody visiting the campus. We thought that would be the best way to learn, at least Mrs. Washington. And I remember we served M.B. Tosin, and I went to the tea today at the M.B. Tosin Library, and that tea was a, called Port Laureate, of, of, uh, and he was a great poet and a great uh, English teacher. English teacher. Hmm? English teacher. Oh, he was an English teacher, but he was also a uh, Writer and a poet. A writer and a poet, and he also presented plays. That's what I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, uh, were there some other activities, organizations that you're part of there at Langston University as a student? Yes, I was a part at that particular time. I was part of the Young Women Christian Association. I was part of the Langston University uh, Women's Dormitory. Association at Fellow Sweetly where we had our devotion and prayer. And we had prayer every Sunday night, believe it or not. And we had singing. And we were get to experience others' talents. Um, I was a part of the Fellow Rocky Club, which was a club that you had to make at least a sea average to join the club. And then I came up. Uh, my junior year, I joined the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. Yes. And that was a big thing. You really had to learn a lot and do a lot of different activities. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that was my senior year, senior year, the last year. And I went to do my student teaching at Luther, Oklahoma. And Luther was just a little country town. Mm -hmm. But that's where I did my student teaching, and I learned a lot there from, when, under Mrs. Ballard, who was a supervising teacher. Mm -hmm. And Miss Gandy was the state supervisor. She taught us on the campus. Mm -hmm. And she also taught us um, how to be good teachers, how to work, go in the community and work with people, make home visits. And she taught us to remember that we had to do something with our children not just let them make a garment, like some people were having making tea towels. We had to have them to make something that they could wear. And they also, they had to model their clothing that they made. Sometimes it was a dress, sometimes a suit, sometimes a coat, <laughs> and sometimes an evening dress. But they had to do their own uh, clothing. And they made clothing for their little, little uh, brothers and sisters at home. If you don't mind me giving you a compliment, every time that I've ever known you, that I've ever seen you, you've really been dressed just uh, lovely and beautiful. Where did that come from? Did that come from this experience or from your home or, or it where? It came from this experience. At least I knew how to, even though I didn't have the clothing and I didn't have the hats and all of that, but I knew what to wear to church and what to wear for sports mm -hmm. affairs and always practice wearing clothing for home wear, school wear. You, so you did your practice teaching at Luther? Luther, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. yeah. And now when you, see, when you graduated, though, uh, from uh, from uh, Langston, then you took a position at, 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 is that Dungy High School in Choctaw? Yes, that was an all-black school. At that time, we called it all-Negro school. Mm -hmm. And when I taught at Dungy School, I had a one-room building where I had to teach 60 kids with five sewing machines. Hmm. And hmm. three of them, three of them would work. <laughs> I learned how to work on the machines. I didn't know how to make, do a, be a mechanic, but I learned how to work with them. Said five and five machines they, and only two worked, is that right? Only three worked. Only three worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, after I was there, I was 
came there in 48 and 49, they built a home economics building. And that was where we really had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. We had a living room, all purpose room, bathroom, and a washer and a dryer in the, in the laundry room. Mm -hmm. And the kids learned how to do laundry by using the washing machine mm -hmm. and the dryer. Mm -hmm. And they learned how to be a good hostess when somebody would come in. They were appointed to be a hostess and they were appointed to be the chairman of the foods committee. We had it where we really had a good home situation. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, so obviously you, you felt the need to go ahead and get your master's degree. So that the, after that first year you taught at Dungey, so that next year uh, you decided to get your master's degree? Well, so, no, it wasn't the next year, it was that summer, the following summer. following summer after your... I began to go and work over at Oklahoma State University. And when I went to Oklahoma State University, I remembered that the lady who was head of the Home Economics Department, I have forgotten her name. It wasn't Dr. O'Toole, was it? Lee no, O'Toole? No. The one before her? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But she was the one who told me, don't you come to this university. You Negroes are not ready. And she talked about how the Negro kids would uh, make fun of them because they had to go to the restaurant and eat with their hands and uh, gloves on. Mm -hmm. And they had to, uh, well, they had to remove their clothes or go mm -hmm. dressed up. And she, uh, told me that I should attend school in Kansas, Ohio, Colorado, or go to... Um, Illinois. Illinois. Illinois, mm-hmm. What? So, so why did you want to go to Oklahoma State University? Because Oklahoma State University is in the state of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. It was inexpensive. Mm -hmm. It was a place where I could go and see my father and my mother and my sisters and brothers on weekends. Mm -hmm. So even though they were older, and I was the youngest one in the family, but I had an older brother who lived there in Zimbabwe. And one thing that happened that I shall never forget is my older brother came to visit us at Christmas time. He had moved to Tulsa. And when he came at Christmas time, he brought his wife and four babies, four or uh, six years old, four years old, three years old and a three month old baby. His wife took sick. Mm -hmm. And when she took sick and had the three day in the morning she died. And that was the most tragic thing that's ever happened in my whole life. Mm -hmm. I shall never forget how we go outdoors and just cry and ask the Lord to help me to do it, to see to help, help my mother with those four boys. My mother and father raised those four boys and all four of them finished high school, went over to Charleston, found a job at the nightclub, mm -hmm. and came back country club. at the country club. Mm -hmm. And they'd go to Langston every weekend, mm -hmm. Go and, and they went to Langston each, each year mm -hmm. until well, they finished. Well, Nancy, let me ask you this. What, uh, what, you know, at that time, higher education institutions in Oklahoma, including OSU, uh, had been segregated up to that time. What legal event changed that, uh, that allowed you to enroll at Oklahoma State? Well, the legal uh, event that took place was that Ada Lois Scipio mm -hmm. fought a court battle for two years, and also G.W. McLaurin mm -hmm. thought he was wanting to get a master's degree in English and education, and Ada Lois wanted to get her law degree. Mm -hmm. At that time, Ada Lois Scipio, who was my uh, dormitory mate, she lived in the same dormitory, mm -hmm. she decided that she was going to fight and go into school and get her doctor, or get her law degree. Mm -hmm. And she did that with the help of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Mm -hmm. And they had a lawyer by the name of Amos T. Hall that fought the case for them, mm -hmm. and Thurgood Marshall who was on the Supreme Court, they fought the case and they won. So Ada Lewis went to uh, OSU and they decided that they would not let her in the school but they would have a little law school at the state capitol. Mm -hmm. So they had a law school at the state capitol 
but it was too expensive to keep up because they only had one student and mm -hmm. one professor, and it was too expensive, so they decided to not have it, the law school. They had, they had to let it go. Well, Nancy, what, uh, it must have taken courage to enroll in an all-white, very large you know, university. Uh, what gave you the strength and the conviction to, to do that? Well, I think really my mother and my father, if you want something, you have to work for it. Work hard. Be determined. Don't you give up. You stay right with it. You can do it. So my mother and my father, my church, my uh, sisters and my brothers, they all said, you can do it, girl. You're smart. You can do it. And you know what this feeling that you have self-esteem telling you that you can do it, I felt that I could do it. I felt that I was ready because of the hard work that my parents had done. So that I went on to so, have the faith and the courage and most of the faith in God. Uh, Nancy, kind of going back to a question we were talking about earlier about you know, why you enrolled at Oklahoma State University. I know your parents encouraged you and then can you share with us a little bit more about that? Well, my dad was one that always had visions and he was a man that believed that we could go places if we get an education. So he would listen to the radio, read the papers, and at that time we didn't have a television, but he'd keep up and he said, I'm just listening to this radio and I read in the paper where this school at Stillwater is going to be a great school and it's going to grow. And I sure would like to see you get your degree from Langston, get your degree, get your get out of high school and go there, but you won't be able to go because it's not a school for Negroes to go to. So he instilled in me that I could go. And at that time, Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, Rosa Parks, they had open doors, not then, nor it was later on. Mm -hmm. um, but, so but he was the one who that really encouraged me mm -hmm. to get my education go to OU and take, I mean, Langston University, uh, Stillwater, mm -hmm. and get your degree, mm -hmm. because that school is going to be a reputable school. They had quite a reputation nationally mm -hmm. was growing. Even, in even when it was growing. Mm -hmm. Great. The well, what, home uh, economics program. Mm -hmm. Well, he said it would have the best agriculture and home economics department. And I think he was right. It was, mm -hmm. it was really getting strong in the reputation at that time. Mm -hmm. What uh, so you but so you attended in the summers because you were still teaching. So you was it three or four summers or you started in the summer of 1949? I started the summer of 49, mm -hmm. and there's 50, 51, 52, four summers mm -hmm. that I worked hard to go to school at Oklahoma State University. At that time, we did not have any scholarship program. I had my dad and mother had sent me to Langston University where I did not have to work. But I decided myself that I would go to school during the summer because a lot of teachers were doing that. Go to school at a big university and then go and teach during the fall. So that's what I did. Well, do you recall the admissions and enrollment process? Uh, can you tell me about that experience? You, you come up to Oklahoma State University in Rowe. How did, what kind of experience was that for you? Well, that was uh, an experience that they, I went to the, to the um, registrar's office, mm -hmm. asked if I could uh, enroll, so they told me that I had to go and see the head of the department. And the head of the department was a lady that should, certainly was not ready. She said, we weren't ready. And she said, you're not ready to go to school here because Negroes are not there. And she talked about how uh, this man from Guthrie, who was a janitor, stole the seal from Guthrie, Oklahoma, and took it to Oklahoma City. She didn't realize there were some whites happening. But she said that he was the one that stole the seal. She was from Guthrie. And she just was upset because of that. And she told me that I just should go to school in Illinois, Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, Kansas, or uh, some school out of state. Because at that time, the state was paying the tuition for those who went out of, out of state. And I told her, I teach her, well, why don't you do that? I told her, no, 
I want to go to school in my own state. This is where I was born and reared. And uh, she, this was the head of the uh, department, the Home Economics Education yes. Department? Mm -hmm. mm hmm Okay. She well, wrote uh, a book. I wish I... Mm -hmm. So, had, had you been on the OSU campus before? I mean, what, what, what was your first impression of OSU when you come on campus? Well, when I came on the campus, it was just a very small campus. Mm -hmm. I remember the old fire station. I remember the administration building. I remember the home economics building, uh, science building, and there were and, and OSU was doing a lots of remodeling. I had to go across the street to to go to on my block, to a two-story brown white brown and white house for my classes at the very beginning. And those girls in the classroom were just happy to have me. Well, uh, so I understand you were the you were the that summer of 1949. You were the first African American student to enroll at Oklahoma State University. Is that is that correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. you know what? They gave a test the second week of school. And when I had this test, this is where they told the they they were surprised that I made such a high score on the test, the second highest grade. And they they were surprised. And they told the professor the next Monday morning, we uh, disagree with the state law. We want Nancy to sit in the classroom with us. And the professors became nervous, uneasy and upset. And they said that we can't, uh, they didn't want to lose their job. Nancy, see if, if I understand right, state law at that time said, you know, that while you could enroll at Oklahoma State University, you had, had to be separate. That's right. And so they had you sit out in the, in, in the hallway just with the door open where you could hear the lecture, but you're out in the hallway. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or either in the back of the room. And, so then and they, I had to sit in a little space where they had a little office in one of the classrooms. So so how many how many classes did you take that first time? I took three classes. Th three classes? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, was, this, was this graduate level classes? Uh, these were primary? graduate level classes. Mm -hmm. I took a class in teaching home economics to high school students, a class in methods of teaching, mm -hmm. and another class in um, how to get children interested in their clubs and organizations. And uh, we had, at that time, the new homemakers of America for the black students and the future homemakers of America for the white students. So I taught found different ways that we could get the kids interested in, in really working and working hard in order to keep the organizations together. And we are, I had one of the largest home economics classes in the state at that time, had one of the largest home economics clubs in the state. And they thought I was just a smart little girl, <laughs> a smart what, little uh, teacher. You, you tell me a little bit about that now. Did, you had three classes. Did when you first started, did you have to sit outside in all three of those classes? No, in one class I had to sit class. in the hallway. Mm -hmm. Another class I had to sit in the back of the room, mm -hmm. and another class I had to sit in the office space, oh, okay. which was very small. Mm -hmm. And the teacher, I couldn't hardly see or hear sometimes. So, so is the, is the year but progressed though? I mean, it's the summer semester. You got to move into the back of the class in all three of those after, classes. After the summer was over. Mm -hmm. I did not have to do that, but we, at that time, I had to. The first year and the second year, I stayed in the community of Stillwater. Mm -hmm. I lived with the, in the home with the principal and his wife and two daughters, the L.A. Ward family, mm -hmm. and that was Versadale and Ella Pearl Ward. Which my, I called them my sisters because they treated me real nice. Mm -hmm. And the next time I stayed with the Jones family, they lived next door. Mr. Ward was going to school at Colorado State, and he was taking um, administration courses. So when he came home, well, I had to stay next door because they didn't have enough room for me at the Ward's house. Were these African-American families, or were, they, were these white families that you're talking about? They were black families. Black families. He was the principal of the Booker, Tube, of the Booker Washington School. Washington School. Mm -hmm. Washington School. Mm -hmm. Here's still water. Okay. 
and his daughter said, I came to the school, and one daughter was going, just graduating from high school, and the other daughter was about two or three years, about a sophomore in high school, and they were just really nice, sweet young ladies. Okay. Well, Nancy, what, we're talking a little bit about your, you know, the, uh, uh, the instructors that you had, a little bit of reception. Uh, can you tell about your, your your class experience with your fellow students? How did your fellow students? How did you relate to them? How they relate to you? Well, the fellow students were really wonderful. Mm -hmm. They asked the professors that well, we weren't Nancy to sit in the classroom with us, and they would tell me it every day. Nancy, don't want to sit by me today. They acted as if I was a special person because I would sit with them, study with them. Go to the library that we had a little library there in the building. Go to the library, study, make out lesson plans that we would use for our classes, mm -hmm. and we uh, also had demonstrations that we had to carry on. Mm -hmm. And we had demonstrations for from each girl in the each day in the classroom. A demonstration. I gave a demonstration on cake baking and one on decorating cake because I had done a lot of that. How about outside the classroom? Were you involved in any activities? I know you were pretty much studying there in the summer, but were you in any activities and did you interact with students outside of the classroom? Yes. I would go with them on field trips and that was outside the classroom. And I would also go with them on a field trip where they were looking at me real funny because I was sitting inside of one or two cafes, and I decided not to go on the next lab field trip because I had to go home and see my parents on that weekend. Did, did you normally, how often did you go home? I would go home practically every other week. My mother was taking care of my little nephews, and I would go home and help her with the laundry and housework and things like that. That's good. Uh, did, uh, so you, you felt welcomed and accepted by the students there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Accepted by the students better than with the, with mm -hmm. the uh, faculty members. Mm -hmm. Were there any, were there any uh, less than, uh, than positive experiences that you remember? Uh, uh, were there some uh, less than positive experiences that you, you heard up on the state that, that with students? Well, the, big, the most, most positive experience I had was going on a field trip, mm -hmm. and we were there at a cafe, and they were eating, and I remember when some of the girls were saying, well, Nancy can't eat here, Well, if she can't eat here, we won't eat here. And they would take me to Sepulpa to visit my parents on weekends. They were just as nice to me as if they had known me. I would tell them, uh, they would ask me about the patterns that I used because back there we made out of clothing. Mm -hmm. And they would ask me about the different patterns that I used and how I made this different dress and different things. And uh, do you remember some of your professors? Were there some of them that were, were helpful to you? Did you recall some that were mentors to you? Yes, Dr. Ron Ella. She wasn't a doctor, Mrs. Ron Ella. She was from Ohio, and she was my major professor. Dr. Nellie Pearson, who was one of my professors, and she was just as nice as she could be, and she didn't care whether I was black or white. If, if something needed to be done, she would tell, ask me to do it, ask the girls to do it. And we had another lady, oh, I can't think of her name. I should have I can't think of a name, but she was one who really taught us a lot about FHA and NHA, mm -hmm. how to get the girls in meetings and how to carry a meeting on and follow the rules of order. Mm -hmm. Etiquette and things. Mm -hmm. Etiquette. Etiquette. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Parliamentary procedures. Parliamentary procedures. That's what we had. We had studied the know how to carry on. Well, Nancy, did uh, do you uh, did you have some favorite places on campus, student hangouts, places that you went as a student on and off campus? 
Well, on on the campus, um, I would go to the uh, I'd, I'd leave the campus and go to some of the fast food place. They had a little Dairy Queen, mm -hmm. and they had places like uh, Sonics, but it wasn't called Sonics. Did you go to after they opened the student union in 1950? Did you did you go to the student union? I went to the student union after so many of the black students came out. And I went with them, but had I gone before then, I would have been going by myself because most of these uh, girls were as poor as I was, yeah. and they always said that they would didn't have money to eat in the cafeteria. So we uh, ate in the cafeteria occasionally, but not often. It ate in the cafeteria at the end of our classes. Uh, that's at, at the end of the month that we were here. Nancy, how did it that first summer in 1949? You were you were the only black student enrolled on the campus. How did it feel to be the you know the only out of several thousand students to be the only black student? Now I was not the only black student. There was a man who was majoring in in uh, industrial arts. He was a brother to Ruby Hall. His name was Herbert Hitler, oh. and he was an industrial arts major. Okay. I did never get to meet him the whole time I was here. That summer, mm -hmm. I tried to get in contact with him, but he was busy and I was busy. Uh, we had students coming the, mm -hmm. the third summer. We had students coming, and they provided a hall for us, mm -hmm. Hannah Hall. I shall never forget her. Mm -hmm. And all the black people had to stay in the hall. Uh, the first floor was for the ladies, second floor was for the men, and third floor, no, no, first floor was for the married couple, and the second floor was for the ladies, and the third floor was for the men. And that was Hannah Hall. And Hannah Hall? Mm hmm. It's across from Student Union. Okay. Well, did, uh, as you, progressed through those four summers from 1949 to 1952 in those years. Uh, how did the attitudes by students and faculty change over that time toward you? Well, uh, I remember the third Sunday summer we had uh, competition seemingly with uh, the white students and the black students. Um, it wasn't any big competition, but they try to have like we had posters to make, we had lesson plans to make out, and we had uh, different kinds of little activities going on with, in the classroom. And I noticed that the black students would stick together and the white students would stick together. But so far as any, any uh, major animosity or anything like that. Did, did people seem to be a little more accepting after a little while than they were they, in the first They team? were. Mm -hmm more welcoming and more accepting? Mm. Well, I don't think they were any more welcoming because the first year, <laughs> it was really welcome to me because I was the only one. But when lots of us came, it was just about the same. Mm -hmm. and so, kind of go back to the question about when you first enrolled at Oklahoma State University and you said it was less than inviting, but now, can you share with us I think you had indicated earlier that maybe you had difficulty getting a role the first time you came here? Yes, I did. The uh, head of the Home Economics Department told me that we were not ready and that you should wait and go to school in Kansas, Colorado, uh, either in Ohio. And I uh, decided that I was going to go to school here anyway. I said, well, I think I should go to school here. This is my home. Oklahoma's my home, and I don't have the money to go to other schools, so I'm going to go to, go to school here. So But, but, they, I, but they, they refused to enroll you that, that first time, is they, that correct? They refused to enroll me, but uh, I think somebody called the Black Dispatch, which is uh, Roscoe Dungey's office, and told them that Nancy Davis had not been able to get in school and she's trying. So Roscoe Dungey, who is the president of the NAACP in Amos Street Hall, came to this university and talked to them, and they let me enroll within three days. 
they told them legally how it had to be, right? Yes. Okay. I appreciate you sharing that, that story that, that explains some things. Uh, you're, uh, but looking back now, after you've got your, your degree, uh, just ask you a little bit, did it, did it feel good to finally get that diploma? I mean, after all that hard work and, and four summers and getting turned down and, uh, and some of the difficulties you had, yes, you must have felt good about that. I not only went four summers, I would come on Saturdays when I was working on my thesis. My advisor, Ron Edler, would mm -hmm. tell me that uh, she would help me with my thesis if I could come through on a Saturday, so I'd come on Saturdays. And I also took a few classes from OU at night, mm -hmm. methods and teaching and some other classes that, that I took at OU in order to be, in order to have enough credits to finish in 1953. Well, did, uh, how did your graduate uh, education at Oklahoma State University help you in your professional career? Was it important to you? Was it helpful to you? It was very helpful. It was knowledgeable. I was able to work with the parents and be down to earth, not feel that I was uh, above anybody. Mm -hmm. And it was helpful in helping me to know how to do a lot of little things in the community with the people, like working with the PTA mm -hmm. and working with the different organizations that they had at our church. So you, so you learned in, 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 I think I hear you saying in addition to the, to the professional and technical expertise you learn, and also just the how to reach the, out in the, the community, right. and then the certification, having a degree, a master's degree, from or a state university. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. yes. Sure. I uh, met certifications of the State Department of home, Vocational Home Economics because I was teaching vocational home economics, and the FHA was part of it, uh, NHA. And that's where I, why I took that class that first summer. Well, Nancy, why, why did you want education so bad? I mean, you, you must have really, I mean, you worked hard to get this, and you, you, uh, you know, segregation, persecution, uh, hard times. I mean, what, what was your incentive? What was your motivation? What drove you to get this degree? You had to be tremendously motivated to do this. Well, I was motivated through my professors at Langston. I was motivated through my parents. And at Langston University, I had a professor there by the name of Lenoya Gander, who was state supervisor of the Negro schools. And she always said the you young ladies who were going out to teach, learn to work with the families, learn to get involved, help those children. They don't know anything, so you're going to teach them everything they know, probably everything that they learn. They learn it in the classroom. And she was a great motivator in encouraging me to be ready. Oh, I had a wonderful friend at that time, my husband. He was one who taught, who was a very polite, mannerable young man who would take me out to dinner, because I wasn't used to going out to dinner with those guys at night, and I had a boyfriend there, but Going to Langston University, going to teach at Dungey School, I had this nice, wonderful young man who was very light, polite, very intelligent, and dignified that I really admired. So he would take me out to dinner probably once a week. And he didn't have very much money, but we would go to inexpensive cafes and restaurants. Mm -hmm. The and they were in the black part of town. Motivated you to get your master's. Or oh, he motivated me, to get, motivated me to get my master's because he was working, he had to go out of state to Kansas, Kansas State Teachers College to get his degree. And he was working on the administrative uh, certificate. So he got his master's in, in administration. So, and he became the vice principal at the school where I taught at Daisy School. So he, he was a strong encourager for you. And Very much so. And also my uh, godparents, who were teachers and lived in Cushing, Oklahoma. I had my godparents, uh, Joyce Johnson and Gretchen Johnson. They encouraged me to get my master's and told me to stick with it. Don't give up. It's going to be hard. Well, 
looking back, Nancy, are, are there uh, you know you you've remained an advocate for the OSU College of Human Environmental Sciences through the years. I know they're proud of you over there. Uh, in your opinion, how's how's the college changed over the years, and uh, and what would you tell prospective students about going to OSU today? Well, the university has changed so very much because they have a large uh, building there where they're teaching foods and nutrition. They're teaching uh, all kinds of child development, mm -hmm. and they have a nice child development plant. I just visited there when I came over here on February 2nd, and that plant uh, is there, and they have all kinds of technologies that you use in teaching kids, and the children are divided into classes as if they were in high school. Uh, they had fa fashion design, and they had really a hotel where the kids would go and prepare food, uh, and hotel prepare food for a uh, banquet, and prepare food for different kinds of family reunions. And, it, it, it has just been a turnover of design for home and for mm -hmm. Just increased the, the number of majors and the scope of studies and so Yes, the mm -hmm. scope of studies. Well, Nancy, I forgot to ask you earlier, did did you take classes in the, at, the, at that time, was the new Home Economics, you know, Home Economics West, or were you in the older Home Economics East? Building? I was in the old Home Economics East. Mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. I took uh, foods and nutrition in that particular, and I took a class in home preservation of foods, where we did lots of canning, jelly making, preserve making, and things like that. And in the foods and nutrition, we planned and prepared food for the family. So the new Home Economics West was not open at that time? It wasn't open. You were a student, I see. Okay. Uh, Looking back, in your career, you know, the time you spent at Oklahoma State University, were there some OSU experiences that stand out in your mind that were uh, that were special to you? There were so many things that were special to me because I had not been exposed to working with people in a large area of food, and I was not exposed to being in fashion designing, only designer we got was when we made clothing for ourselves. But in fashion designing, you were making clothing for the stores and department stores, and it was uh, lots of tailoring in the classroom, and we had a lots of uh, preparing preparation for marriage, and planning for weddings, and in making garments for weddings. It was a, a whole new avenue with the home economics, a home, a home environmental sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, would, uh, and so you experienced discrimination in OSU, you, know, yet you persevered. Uh, do you feel that, that your OSU experience and the path that you helped blaze at that time helped prepare the way for other uh, African American students that followed you, especially female students? Yes, I encourage a lot of them by telling them to come to this particular school. Be sure to be sure to keep their grades up so they can be prepared because if your grades are not up you will not be accepted. And I would tell them to get prepared for the new day because you will be working with boys as well as girls. And I had a school life had changed for me in my school because I had a teacher by the name of Clara Luther, who was one that liked to expose her homeroom students to home economics. So I taught those guys how to sew and cook and how to make pants, how to make vests, reversible vests, and they had to be on the fashion show. If they stayed in my classroom, I told them, you, can't, you have to show something that you've done. You can't just come in and sew and say, I made this dress, you have to make it in the classroom and fashion it. You uh, boys had to make best and they had to fashion and pair pants. Now you mentioned Clara Looper. Yes, Clara Looper was a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And I used to go with her downtown with the city movement. Mm -hmm. And we would open doors at John A. Brown's. 
Mm-hmm. And at the different uh, stores like uh, Animals Cafeteria, mm-hmm. Scurvy Tower Hotel, and the uh, different places where they did not want blacks, we, we, we were there. Uh, as we stopped going to the, uh, uh, stopped them from going to places where they had to go to the back door to eat. Restaurant. Yeah. Open doors to restaurants. In your in your opinion, how has the student experience for African American students uh, here at OSU changed since you were a student? Well, it's changed because students now are able to get financial aid. They're getting help from different organizations, giving scholarships, mm-hmm. and they're getting help from the. Um, uh, student organizations, they are more together. They only had a few students, and mm-hmm. when I was here, they only had one or two students. And then the next summer, they had probably about 30 students who came and worked on their master's degree. And then the next summer, they had a big drove of them who came. And they all were interested in getting a master's degree mm-hmm. and Thank improving you. their teaching ability. Uh. Well, uh, Nancy, I'd like to visit with you for a while now, kind of change the subject maybe about uh, your teaching career. You taught home economics for 20 years at Dungy High School in Choctaw, and then for an additional 23 years in Star Spencer, is that right? Yes, I taught 20 years mm-hmm. in Choctaw school system, mm-hmm. but the school system for Dungy School was annexed in 1968. Okay, so they merged together. And it was emerged in 1960. Okay. Uh, can you share some of your teaching experiences with me uh, there at, at Dungy and, and in Choctaw High School? Well, the teaching experience that I had at Dungy School mm-hmm. was uh, that we used books, and sometimes the books were not new. And we had. Uh, a new home economics mm-hmm. building, and we made our own curtains for the home economics room. Mm-hmm. We made our uh, clothing, and we learned and the teaching experience was one that the kids had more hands-on activities. Mm-hmm. And when I went to uh, Dungy, uh, Dungy and Choctaw, the same thing. They were in the same school system. Mm-hmm. However, Dungy School was annexed into Oklahoma City School. Uh, when going to Dallas Spencer High School, we had plenty of things to work with. Each girl had a sewing machine, and maybe she had one or two girls. And each girl had uh, facilities where they could cook together as partners. With Dungy School, I had to give lots of demonstrations in order for the kids to learn because we didn't have the time, we didn't have the equipment to work with. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had uh, uh, plenty of, of uh, aid things like um, uh, overhead projectors to work with at South Spencer. We had films to work with in South Spencer School. Mm-hmm. Now this is an Oklahoma City School. Mm-hmm. It was much better with the equipment and modern technology. Nancy, it, it's, it, speaking of Star Spencer, you also you taught uh, you know, home economics, but also you were a child care instructor. Uh, can, you, can you tell us uh, about what that entailed? Yes, well, I taught child care in Star Spencer mm-hmm. in the last 12 years of my teaching experience. We had a nice little building across the street from the main building. It was in front of the football field. And we had a two-room building. The first building, or first room, was where I taught the 11th graders techniques in teaching and how to teach and how to prepare for teaching. They had to learn different songs and different rhymes. They had to learn how to fish uh, bulletin boards. They had to learn to prepare food for the kids in 11th grade. But when they went into 12th grade, it was just like a student teaching laboratory. They had to put it into practice. We had learn and earn on the job training in the child development there. 
the, the students were become very important teachers and last year they were second year teaching. First year they were learning. So they were learning and then they were put on jobs. So they was a good, had a job opening in a daycare center. The children in the home ec department in the child development department were put on jobs to be assistant teachers or to be teachers. So they had some release time for school, so they'd have some jobs away from school and then also... Yes, they had jobs at school mm -hmm. and a job at, uh, away from school. Mm -hmm. Nancy, was there uh, some special students that you remember you know, that were special to you? Maybe some of them that went on and did something significant in their life or just really uh, give back to the community that, that you remember you taught and that you thought maybe you made a difference in their lives? Listen, I meet people from day to day that I have taught. Mm -hmm. Some I have forgotten and some I remember, mm -hmm. who are teachers in the schools, and they mm -hmm. talk about how the child development class, medicine relations class, food class, they talk about the different things that they learn mm -hmm. in sewing class and how it has helped them and their families. They have also come and told me that they were in charge of child development labs in their home. Uh, home, home, uh, home care facilities. Home, and home, home uh, child development, mm -hmm. where they had them. They're quite prominent mm -hmm. with people who are in the low income families mm -hmm. and they don't have money. The welfare will pay for their, their mm -hmm. children's training. Mm -hmm. And these kids are now are good teachers, they're good uh, child care teachers good seamstress, and they make their living like this, and they are students who can feel that they really have used their talent wisely. Is there any names that we might might know, people that have gone on and have been, been successful that you taught, that, that comes to your mind? Well, the ones that come to my mind would be uh, Wilma Wooten, who is a dress uh, fashion designer, and she makes money like there's her home, and she doesn't have to go out. Another person is Dorsten uh, Mukes, who is a designer and makes evening dresses and all kinds of dresses from evening wear to school wear. And she does a nice job, and she has lots of people coming to her for sewing. And also another one by the name of Olita Orange, Olita makes has lots of grandchildren, and she's made lots of clothing for her grandchildren. And these parents, as I have taught, they are come back to visit me at school, and they visit me in my home. They visit me uh, when we have our home economics meeting. We have a group of ladies who are YHOs, young homemakers of Oklahoma. They are parents of most of the preschool children. They work together with me in presenting fashion shows and presenting dinners, mm -hmm. and we made money to take the kids on nice trips out or, uh, around the state and to the zoos and uh, movies and see uh, Sesame Street and things like that. Well, what, uh, in what ways were you involved with students outside the classroom? Uh, for example, you know, were you a sponsor were you uh, in charge of student activities? Uh, did you interact with students outside the classroom as well? Yes, we interact with them by uh, some of the students that we would interact with would be those who had finished and they had children in the preschool. Mm -hmm. And we had a uh, young homemakers group who had, uh, we didn't have too many blacks that were participating in the Young Homemakers of America. Mm -hmm. But we had Mrs. Zena DeVos, who is the first secretary, state secretary of the Young Homemakers of Oklahoma. We had Mrs. Ogden Henry, who was over the fashion show. And we had uh, a teacher aide who helped us with our fashion show, uh, Joanna Beasley. She was a person that worked with the kids and she worked with me in presenting fashion shows every Christmas and we call it a Christmas fashion show. Mm -hmm. And we draw lots of people in the community because they love to see their little ones perform mm -hmm. and model, they can model. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and they can show off their pretty clothes that their parents have made or either bought for them. Would, uh, what would you tell a young person today who's considering a career in education? Uh, what wisdom would you share with them and would you encourage them? Oh yes, I would urge them to get an education, to be sure to study hard, work hard, to uh, have good character so people will believe in you, work in your community, and to be a person that uh, would help others in the organizations like scholarships that are being prepared. Give those scholarships to some child in the community who is in need. And give yourself at your church when the church is having anything. Uh, young people today sometimes don't find time to work with other people. But I tell them, take time out. It all put to get to the world, it comes back. It was true for you that education made a difference in your life. Do you think that's still important for young men and women that today? education is the key. Mm -hmm. That's my motto. Education is the key. If you have an education and you know people how to work with them and you can reach out and touch others, then you will be much happier and you'll be successful in life. Mm -hmm. And would you encourage, encourage them to go into a teaching profession, into you know, edu education, be a public school teacher? Well, I would encourage them to go in the, in the uh, profession of teaching if they have the knowledge and the willpower to want to help children because our children today are nervous and upset. We have different kinds of homes now. It, children are not getting the spiritual growth mm -hmm. and we need, we don't have our Bibles in the school anymore. We don't have our place or the, we don't have the love for our country that we should have. Mm -hmm. And this would be necessary to teach children as go minds to learn how to respect themselves, their family, respect God first of all, mm -hmm. and to make something out of themselves that they can be somebody. Nancy, uh, religion and your personal religious faith is obviously very important to you. Is this something you learned at home? growing up in your family? No, my religion is something that I learned in the school, in the community, mm -hmm. at church, <clears throat> with my neighbors, and everywhere I go. Because most of the, all of the black people that I knew in that day, they always believed that if you live and you give, it will come back to you. That you should be a person that is ready to accept criticism, and your criticism will help you to be a better person today. Because nobody's perfect. And this is a place where no man is an island. He can't stand alone. Well, those times when you were being persecuted, when you were having to fight hard to get your education and higher education, did your, did your personal faith, was that a, a strong support for you in those tough times? Definitely. As strong to pray every day, to trust God as my mother would always say, not just trust him one time when you get in trouble, but trust God every day. And thank God for all of the good things that you have, as well as the bad days that you have, because those bad, bad days will make you have good days if you look up and trust the Master and know that he's with you. Well, uh there, uh, what community activities, I know you've been involved in a lot of community activities, professional organizations, advocacy causes. Uh, can you share some of these experiences that have been especially important to you? You were talking about some of them earlier. With, with well, some of the organizations that I was uh, involved in was uh, the Urban League, and they raised money to give scholarships, send, have classes, evening classes for the children. Uh, another was PTA. We gave scholarships to the children mm -hmm. and gave dinners. And uh, get, another organization was the NAECP, where we had the children who were going off on trips 
and children who were going downtown would tell new what to do there. She didn't move me where we could get a sandwich or a Coke and sit down rather than stand up, uh, go in the bathroom and use the bathroom without having to walk a mile to the bus station to use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. uh, these organizations were helpful because we felt that this was good for our state and our whole nation, that people could look at you and see that you are the right type of clean individual that they're looking for and not look down on you. Can you share some of your experiences in your early integration activities? You were talking about earlier when you were in Animal's cafeteria and in Brown's and in different, Anthony's, different places. There were some experiences you could share with us. Did you have some, some unpleasant experiences as part of that? Well, we had unpleasant experiences because we go to John A. Brown's every day. And sometimes the kids would just lay out in the floor and they get tired and they would tell them to get up and they would not get up. And they arrested, tried to say that they were arresting, but they didn't arrest them. They arrested Caralupa. And my husband was one of those that always told me, please don't be a jailbird. I don't want to write being a jailbird. So you followed the rules. So I managed not to get arrested. But I was always there with her. And when it came to doing something that they did not for us to do, like we did throwing sing. I won't let nobody turn me around. I won't let nobody turn me around. We keep on walking, keep on stepping. I'm not going to turn around. We just, just sing those songs. And uh, we would uh, go to uh, the uh, Sherman Town Hotel. It was lots of those hotels. They didn't want any blacks there. Mm -hmm. There were people who were there and working in the kitchen. They wanted to get see us get free from having to go to the back door. And they would just, you know, tell us that we just keep on going. And they would encourage us. Uh, Taylor Booth was a person that said she didn't care. They said, you're going to get, your house is going to get burned down. And they did try to burn the house down, but some kind of way they, they didn't burn. And they burned the building that we had where we had our meetings. And they did all manner of different evil things. But we didn't stop. We still built the building back. And we just prayed and asked the Lord to give us strength to build the building back. So Tara Dupa was our leader, and we let her do the talking, and we were to follow her and follow her advice. And you didn't, and you didn't turn around, right? And we did not turn around. <laughs> well, what? Uh, how, how do you feel about race relations and how they've evolved in in America and say in Oklahoma specifically? Are you are you pleased with the direction it's going? The changes have been made. I think race relations is fine in Oklahoma. We have lots of people who will still be uh, different and will not want to be bothered with black people, but we don't worry about that. We just keep our heads up and keep going. There's still challenges there in, in racial there's relations? There's still challenges, yes. Nancy, you've, uh, yes, you've truly lived a life of significance. Uh, you've received numerous recognition from state and national organizations. Uh, from the governor and legislature of the state of Oklahoma. I know the OSU Alumni Association has recognized you with its Distinguished Alumni Award. Uh, there's three different scholarships here at OSU in your name, and then uh, Nancy Randolph Davis' name, and then also Nancy Randolph Davis Day is observed at OSU, you know, one day every year during, during uh, the Black Awareness Week. I mean, wow. Did you, you name the you, Nancy Randolph come, Davis building? <laughs> yeah, that's right, and they got a building named after you, uh, excuse mm -hmm. me. There's uh, the residential life of apartment complex has been named after you. That's right. Uh, you've come a long way since the days you had to sit out in the hallway. That's, that's true. What, what do you think about that? Well, I just think that we have a lot of Christian people here at OSU and good people. I think that we have a lot of um, uh, people around uh, and about from OSU that would like to stop the progress, but you know I feel the good Lord is with us and that we are always going to succeed because we trust Him. 
And the people that are with you are good Christian people. They are people who are reaching out and they want to help those who are wanting to help themselves. Those who are not wanting to help themselves, they, they don't stay long anyway. Mm -hmm. Nancy, looking back on, on, on your life, uh, what accomplishments and recognitions that you received out of all the recognition? Uh, what's given you the most personal satisfaction? The personal satisfaction that I've had is that I am a mother, a, a, a wife, and then a mother, and then I was a teacher, I was a Sunday school teacher, I was a leader in my church, I was a person that was dead in my community. Anything came up that I could help, I would help people. When they had the homes to be burned down, I was there to help. I had personal satisfaction in knowing that I could help the agent. I used to go with the FHA every Saturday, and we would have prayer and would read to the aging people that were there and would um, have um, singing with the aging people. They enjoyed having young people come in. Mm -hmm. This was uh, gratifying to me. And it has really helped because out of my lifetime, I've been in a very serious car accident, and I stayed in the hospital for seven months, and a good doctor saw me through that. I've had two, both of my days, uh, uh, operated on for new knee operations. Mm -hmm. I've come through that, and I said, well, the Lord must be keeping me here for a good purpose. Still got something in mind for you, mm -hmm. right, Nancy? Not nice, not and through I'm with you. Getting, and I'm still getting honors from my church, and my church will be uh, honoring me on the 27th. Uh, the human human environment, human... Uh, environmental sciences? No, uh, human... Uh, Here at OSU, the College of Human Environmental Sciences used to be called Home Economics. No, I'm not thinking about that. I'm oh. talking about the people at the Human Welfare Office. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. they human have, Services? Human Services. They mm -hmm. honored me on the 27th morning. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel that this is just something that the Lord wants me to enjoy while I'm alive. Like Jackson University uh, honored me today at the 11 o'clock service that the 11 o'clock honoring ceremony. Here about a month ago, the human, uh, the Oklahoma Human... Uh, human uh, Service Department service in Oklahoma City. In the, uh, it's going to be at Mount Ida Baptist Church on the 27th. Mm -hmm. And on that night, my church is having an honorary service mm -hmm. for me at 7 o'clock and having a play mm -hmm. depicting Nancy Davis at OSU as the first African American. Well, in the Human Rights Commission, Dishonored you here about a month ago, is that correct? No, that was the human, yeah, human rights. They did also. Mm -hmm. And then the governor of Oklahoma, he was the one that appointed, mm -hmm. appointed me as uh, a lay member on the State Board of Nursing. For first lay members, I recall, isn't that right? Mm hmm. Right. First lay member mm -hmm. of the Nursing Board. Just accolades uh, mm -hmm. abound. I have them. <laughs> And the people in the uh, Young Homemakers of America, my garden, plant garden and savings club, I shouldn't forget them. They have one of me, the Amelia's Club, which is the oldest club in Oklahoma City. They were organized in 1944, and there's a club that uh, Carol was president, and now there's a the Coleman was president, and they're honoring me. I get honors every time you turn around. <laughs> well, Nancy, what uh, values have been most important to you and and that you've tried to impart into students that you've taught and into people that you've come into contact with through the years? What what uh, principles, what values have been important to you that you've tried to share with others? Well, some of the values are that uh, we should always remember to put God first in our life. Try to help others. Reach out and help those who are sick and down or afflicted. 
help the uh, children who are orphans. So many times they are overlooked. And to encourage children to go to college in the scholarships program, in working with my sorority, we reach out and we give over $10,000 a year in scholarships. Um, the top base, I think you remember, they invited you where they invited at where they honored me as the top ladies in 2002. Show me your decisions until I can't remember all of them. Mm -hmm. Bob Beta, mm -hmm. uh, Sigma Gamma Rho sorority, they honored me. Mm -hmm. And the Delta Sigma Theta, I mean, um, not Delta, the Zeta Phi Beta sorority has honored me. And my sorority has honored me just a number of times. It's the most outstanding sorority in my chapter when there are about 220 of us. Great. What, uh, Nancy, what, uh, how, how do you hope people uh, will remember uh, Nancy Randolph Davis? I mean, looking back in your life, how do you hope they'll remember you? And what, what do you want them to remember you for? I just want them to remember me as a person who's reaching out trying to help others and helping myself. Remember as a me as a person who was an educator did not think uh, that I was the leader, but they were just as important as I was. Mm -hmm. well, Nancy, is there, is there anything else we haven't covered? Is there anything you'd like to share with us that we haven't talked about? I think uh, that we've covered about everything. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.